it's also important to realize that it doesn't define who you are running. It's something that in order for it to be a healthy hobby, it needs to be something you choose to do, not something that drives you and controls you. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running for Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, who has been in five weddings. Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 113 of the Running For Real podcast. If this is your first time listening, welcome to the Running For Real podcast. If this is your 113th or maybe your 57th or whatever else, welcome back and thank you so much for tuning in today. Now, last week we had an episode that I recorded well over a year ago, but it was still full of solid gold from Pete McGill. It was all about running a fast 5k and fast 10k. And I know that right now, you know, all the marathons are going on. You're probably feeling a bit fed up if you're not doing them. Or maybe if you just did one, you're feeling a bit down. But actually, sometimes it's good to do a 5k or 10k segment. And I definitely think it is after doing a uh, marathon. And this episode was particularly focused on masters runners because, yes, you can run faster in shorter distances. And I know sometimes it can feel like once you reach a certain age, you should be heading to the longer things. But actually, you can run fast again. And that I hope that episode was helpful for you. Now, today we have part two of my episode with my sports psychologist, Evie. About a month ago, I had Evie on the show to answer your questions that you submitted in the Running For Your Superstars community. We had a lot of responses and we were not able to get through them all. So today we finished the rest of them. And these ones are definitely more varied in their topics, but for sure new talking about and things that I think you will find really helpful. Now, I know you love these episodes with the sports psychologist and you've really been enjoying these Evie ones and that's why I keep bringing her back. These sports psychology ones always end up being your personal favorites and mine too. So for that reason, in a few weeks, I will have a week of mental training and motivational episodes coming your way because as Evie talked about last time and in this episode, actually, we all have different things that work for us. So I figured if I gave you lots of approaches from some of the best motivational speakers and psychologists in the sporting world, you can take pieces of each one and find bits that speak to you and create your own magical mix of of a mental training practice. Now, after we thank our sponsors, Nuni and Aftershocks, we'll be right to the episode. This podcast is brought to you by NooNeeShop.com. Don't let knee pain help you from completing your long runs or worse, sidelining you altogether. Nooney is designed specifically to relieve that dreaded runner's knee pain. Unlike a typical knee sleeve, Nooney relieves the pressure at the source of the pain. And the research reveals if you get the pressure away, you get the pain away. Runners from coast to coast are getting instant relief with Nooney and Nooney can help you get back to running without knee pain. Use code Tina Muir at nooneeshop.com. That's N U N E E S H O P.com for a 20% discount. This episode is sponsored by Aftershocks, the award winning headphone brand, best known for its open ear listening experience, powered by patented best in class bone conduction technology. Aftershocks headphones sit outside your ear so you can hear your music and your surroundings. I know. Aftershocks is a must-have for runners, providing the ultimate level of safety and comfort without compromising sound quality. To learn more and save $50 on Aftershocks endurance bundles, visit tina.aftershocks.com. That's T-I-N-A dot A-F-T-E-R-S-H-O-K-Z dot com. Evie, my dear friend, welcome back to the Running Field podcast. We are doing part two of your questions, answering other people's questions. And uh, yeah, this is going to be fun. I think a lot of the questions we missed last time were kind of a bit different. And so these are going to be maybe a bit, I don't know, things maybe we haven't talked about before, whereas the ones from last time, as you noted, are very common, common things that runners struggle with. Um, so how are you doing, firstly? You want to update the listeners on pregnancy, how things are going? 
Oh, yeah, feeling feeling great, feeling healthy. Had a good swim today, which was nice, just trying to tick over and keep fit, uh, which is really nice when you don't have to focus on training. I yeah. think everyone can appreciate that when you've got, you know, a really good reason not to train. It's mm-hmm. just really nice to kick back. So feeling good and, yeah, really looking forward to part two of our, our chat. Yeah, this is going to be fun. So I want to start with one from Sarah Williarty, which is about – you know, we've some people will have already done their big races by the time this one's coming out. But, you know, we may have some more coming in May, June, some big races. But if not, people can save this for future races. So Sarah wanted to know, what are some of the best techniques for mentally preparing for a big goal? She said, what if our physical fitness is there, but we are wondering if our brains are ready to meet the challenge? Now, this is a common one that runners yeah. are scared about being just particularly with a marathon, you know, you've got that whole, you, you're thinking about what 26.2 miles means, or even ultra races, what 50 miles means, what hundred miles means. And we know we've done the training, but it just, you're never in those distances going to be able to do the distance at the pace until the day. So, um, what would you say for the, for this kind of question? Yeah, it's a good one. And again, as you say, it's, it's, it's natural to think about that. Um, as much as we train each day and we break it down in training and we have our mini goals, I'd say the, the best thing to do is essentially keep the structure that you've had in training for the race. So as soon as you think about the volume of what's ahead of you, you know, I've got this 26 miles or I've got this 30 mile ultra race to do, of course your nerves are going to go up. You know, it's a long way. So I would suggest you break it down and have really small, specific process goals to keep yourself task-focused, keep yourself in the moment, really focusing on one foot in front of the other. And it could be that you break it down in time. So you can say to yourself, I'm going to run for two minutes and then I'm going to reset, I'm going to keep running for another two minutes. Some people choose checkpoints Mm. or field stops. So I think for me that's what I tend to do, yeah. Okay. How many are there in a marathon? Remind me, it's been a while since I've done one. <laughs> I mean, it really depends on the race. Um, I think okay. a lot of places have uh, water every mile. Um, a lot of places yeah. will have it every 5K, some fuel. Um, or, you know, some races might have cheer stations every few miles, which you could, you know, make that a goal to get there because they then you can soak up their energy. I, th- I think it's pretty varied with how often they have them. But a mile is, I think, probably the most you're going to be able to get. Yeah, and it depends on, it's really personal and it might be that you prefer to break it down every, so tick off five miles. Okay, in five miles I'm going to reset, I'm going to have some fuel, have some food and use the things around you to help you stay motivated and to as goals. So use the crowd around you. I'm going to focus on the crowd for the next few minutes, really draw off their energy so and help. Physically looking at them, does that help or... Should you yeah, be think, just kind of listening? I think both. Like maybe picking out faces and being like, you know, that person is actually clapping their hands and looking at me. Yeah, and I think, and the thing with having your race, having a name on the front of your shirt, mm. I remember doing New York and I, I'll never forget this one moment. I was at mile, it was quite early on, mile 15 or 16. And I think a big fridge just passed me. You know, I was, <laughs> I was struggling. Um person dressed as a fridge ran past and I just had that moment and it doesn't take much, does it? All of a sudden you'll be, you'll go from feeling really good to wow, really struggling mentally or physically suddenly feeling the fatigue kick in. That happened to me and I was uh, on a bridge at the time. And as soon as I got out of the bridge, I didn't panic. I I didn't, I stopped thinking about 10 miles ahead of me because what's that going to do? It's going to spike my anxiety. And I looked at the crowd and I had my name on my shirt and I remember to this day, this woman yelled out my name and she said, Evie, you're looking really strong. Keep running. And I just blocked out all the other noise and heard her voice. And I remember the feeling of power and energy it gave me really good for that. So then I started to, I, I used that voice. And then a few miles later, I'd look in the crowd and just focus on someone and draw a bit of energy from them. So there are people in the crowds there are the the time yourself every 10 minutes focus on checkpoints or water breaks, but really break it down. That's how you mentally prepare. You keep that structure that you've had in training in the race. Mm -hmm. So Eva, you're saying that you can think about this even before race day. 
Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Have a strategy for it because that will keep you task focused. That will keep you calm. That will keep you from thinking of the outcome because, you know, the end of that race isn't a goal. It's an outcome. Mm-hmm. The end of that race occurs because of all the little goals that you achieve along the way. Yep. All the little successes you have. Okay. All right. So that's kind of the last question we had of all the ones we had that were about, you know, racing and uh-huh. kind of the nervousness around it. So we mostly focused on that last time. We didn't quite get enough time to to get that Sarah, question from Sarah in. But let's kind of go through some maybe more random, just kind of a bit more specific Topical. questions, yeah, that people might have that aren't answered other places. So the first okay. one is kind of related to after a race. So we've kind of gone through the whole racing gamut of questions in the last episode. But Mike, uh, who we answered his question last time, also had a question about recognizing training burnout, how to know when you're ready to resume after taking a break. Now, this is something I, I'm so glad we're going to be talking about because it's something really important to me to have people take a break after a race, uh, particularly after a race, but also just even if you're not doing one goal race to take a, a break mm-hmm. a few times a year, not so much physically because of the mental fatigue and the mental like reset so from a psychologist point of view why mm-hmm. is that so important in the first place and then we'll get to Mike's question well I think the the, the, the hint the clue is in the word burnout you know it's it's such a huge event train and it's not it's not so much the race that you do that is the big event it's it's the whole lead up to it mm-hmm. and that can vary from you know an entire season of racing people training all year, people training for a few months before an event. But there's a lot that goes into planning for an event, and not just physically or mentally, but also emotionally. There's the balance of family and training and work. You know, often the stress for clients that I talk to is that balance. How do I make sure that I'm training and focusing on my training? Because when I'm training, I'm feeling guilty about not being with my family or not doing other things I have to do. So when you've worked out a schedule that works for you all those months ahead of an event and then you do the event and then you have this huge, sometimes it's a low. And even if the event goes really well, mm. you just have this huge, have you experienced that where you have a huge, oh, yeah. oh, anti, like an anticlimax or huge dump of emotion, energy, everything. And I, it's really hard. It's hard to say, you know, you need to rest for a month or two months it's very personal. It depends on your whole recovery rate. So the first thing I would suggest is really know your body and get some advice before the event about recovery. Before you compete. Yeah. Before you compete, speak to an expert about rates of recovery, speak to someone about accumulative fatigue. And a lot of people train in that working heart rate zone between 70 and 85, 90, don't they? They And even their easy runs tend to be quite quick. So they might be able to hold it together for the event, but often what happens is because they've really exercised and pushed their body to that point of almost fatigue after the event, they can be a lot more vulnerable emotionally, physically, and mentally. So it's really important for everybody to, to take stock. And that can vary from probably in a week for a 5K right through to a couple of months, three months, for as long as people need. But, but I think you're saying take it off or kind of it can be a combination or? I think a combination. But And I think the way you work that out is really understanding yourself, having really good self-awareness. And that comes from, you know, before the event and in training, you know, running to effort, also knowing your heart rate. You know, if your heart rate... If you've run a marathon, you have a couple of weeks off and just to rest mentally and emotionally and physically, and then you start going for easy runs and you realize and you notice your heart rate's really high. Well, I'm telling you, you're not ready to return. You need to rest. And I think people have a, a perception of not running that's linked to they are lazy or they're they feel guilty or they're cheating. There's a, there's a really interesting perception of rest rather than it being recovery. It's almost, it feels like a detrimental thing that you're doing. 
Um, and athletes that succeed and, and the ones at the top learn, sometimes the hard way too, they learn that recovery, resting and not running is such a, a key part of their training. Mm -hmm. It's probably the most important part of their training. And when you are resting to rest mentally, it's no good resting physically if you're stressing about not running. Mm -hmm. That's going to make, no, you know, you're not going to be recovering. So what if someone finds that they are resting their body, but they aren't mentally recovering or resting? What would you say? They need to take more time. So you're saying if, if they're taking a week off and it's really stressing them out, that's more sign that you need longer than it. You need until you're kind of at peace with it? I think so. And also I would suggest, you know, speak to someone like myself about why you're stressing. What is it that's actually worrying you, but worrying you about not running? You know, is it the fear? Why are you fearing not running? Mm -hmm. Running should be something that's conducive to health and well-being. It shouldn't be something that when you're not doing it, you you feel you fear not doing it. It should be a really healthy, wholesome part of your life. Do you know what I'm? Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I th no, I think you're exactly right, and I I, I think that's important to mention. Um, and and then what about the other end of it, where people might say, okay, I'm going to take five to 10 days off and they get four days in and they're like, oh God, I really need to run tomorrow. You know, I, I've taken five days. Of, you know, I'm doing the minimum, but I really need to get back to running. Would you say that in itself? Maybe if they were okay the first three days and then after three days they started to stress, um, but not necessarily. Do you know that you're mentally recovered at that point or is it kind of maybe a calories? I don't want to gain weight. I don't want to lose fitness. Is that kind of anxiety coming through and that's what is making you want to run rather than actually physically feeling recovered. Does that make sense? Oh, that's exactly. And that's, that's one of the variables, isn't it? It's because when you're not running, everything shifts the way you eat, uh, the way you sleep, the way you feel, it's like tapering. It, it doesn't feel great. Mm -hmm. And yet the key is to really know yourself and be very self-aware of how you're feeling about not running and compromise with yourself. Go for a walk, start, start back slowly, go for a trail run, make it more about getting back to what you love to do rather than training and performing. Try and find that balance of that love for what you do okay. to take the pressure off. And because a lot of people, they do really miss it in a positive way. It's a, it's part of who they are and it's important to have that. It's also important to realize that it doesn't define who you are running. It's something that in order for it to be a healthy hobby, it needs to be something you choose to do, not something that drives you and controls you. Mm -hmm. So, right. you know, having that, having a few days off is great. Grab a friend and go for a trail run, do some cross training, go for a swim. If it's, what is it that you're missing? Is it the adrenaline, the feeling of moving? But if you is do that, that, is that not kind of, I don't know. Like for me, I've always felt like whenever people said to me they took three days off and then they, they needed to get back to it. So they started swimming every day. Like I've always felt like to me, that's a sign that it is, you're too invested in this. Like you're too concerned with, and maybe you tell me you're the expert here, but that I've always felt if someone said that, that they, they do let running define them or their fitness or the way they look or their, you know, their eating, they let that define them. Because I may have had, you know, struggled with, with now I see disordered eating with kind of um, feeling like my running defined me. But I know for a fact when it came to that time off, I took it seriously and I, I full rested for two weeks. So and what was it, what was it that helped you come to peace with taking that time off and making it, you know, part of your training? How, how did you go I about I mean, that? for me mentally, I could accept that I needed it. Like I, especially myself, I, because I could put myself so far into the well, I mm. mentally just couldn't push myself. Like if you asked me to run hard, I mm. would probably try and run hard and then walk because I just mentally didn't have the desire to. But I will also say that I also recognize that, and anyone listening, maybe, you know, maybe if you're coming into the final month of training and you're kind of feeling a bit over it, maybe you get to race day and you're excited again, but maybe you have a few weeks of where you're like, oh, I just don't want to run or oh, I can't wait to just rest. Mm -hmm. And even if you get it back, like immediately after the race, that high kind of makes you forget that stuff. I would always 
remind myself that that's how I felt. And really that's how my body was actually feeling. It was just the kind of post run or post race endorphins that were kind of hiding that fact. So I always knew that even though I felt good in that moment, physic, uh, mentally, because I'd had this race, I knew that underneath that my body and my mind were just tired. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And you know, it comes down to self-compassion, Tina, as well. We've talked about this a lot and this approach towards recovery and resting. It's the, the most positive, important part of anyone's training. So having time off after, having time away from running after a race or an event, A, you deserve it. You, you deserve to, to let your body have that break. You deserve to let your mind have that break. You know, you might have family. You want to spend more time with them. And I would, sometimes people book holidays. Mm. So that's you know, it doesn't have to be overseas, but it can just be something that they, a course that they wanted to do or something that they know they really want to sink their teeth into and they've got the opportunity because they know that they need to be recovering and knowing themselves, they also know that having something booked in that they have to commit to is helpful in order to help them stick to that after the event. Uh, the more the, the more self-awareness people have and the more self-compassion people can develop for themselves, I think the more at peace people are and the easier it is for them to choose to have time off after a big event. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the brain and the body, you can't separate them as much as you physically need it. You, you can always measure that physical recovery, can't you? You know that you could feel that you've got DOMS. You know that you need to have rest. It's harder to be aware of the mental fatigue that you've built up that you need to repair and recover mm -hmm. from. So what would you say yeah. to someone listening right now? Because this is, this is going to be a few weeks after Boston, a uh, few yeah. days, maybe the weekend. I think actually this comes out is the weekend of London Marathon and, and plenty of other races coming. What would you say to someone listening who maybe either had a good race or didn't and mm. has either, you know, decided, okay, I'm going to take two weeks off. They're now in day three. Their soreness has gone. They're feeling like, okay, well, I think maybe I'll just take like five days off and, 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 and that'll be okay. Either because they want to get back to kind of proving that they, that was a fluke, the bad race, or they want to mm. get back to achieving the next goal. If you were to talk to them right now and you, you know, you knew they were tired, they, they physically are tired. They emotionally know they are tired deep down, but they just feel that urge of, oh no, no, I, I'm fine. I'm fine. I, I just need to get back into it. If you could talk, mm. sit down next to them, what would you say? I'd be asking them to explain why. Tell me more about needing to get back. What is it you're afraid of not having by not running? You're really picking that part because that's what that's where the vulnerability is with people and that's where those common uh, thought processes around, oh, calories, don't want to gain weight, the fear-based reasons, that's when they surface. So. Being able to do that for yourself is is really good, um, but also, yeah, I mean, I, I have people that come and see me and we talk about those, managing those thought processes after, but I would say to them, you know, really have a good sit down and actually pick up a pen and write down, re reflect on the race and write down everything that went really well, all the progress that they've made in this, to the point where they are with this event. So all the training they've done, what did you accomplish? How did you improve over the last six months? So look at what you've done and achieved because building up that sense of positivity and achievement can help you feel more positive in that moment and help you perhaps have a healthier perspective on needing to return to running straight away because the, when you look at the evidence of, of what you've done and how much, how many miles you've accumulated in training, mm. how, how much you've put your body through, how well your body has served you for the last six months of training. When you read that on paper with the, like a reflection, you then can start to see, wow, actually you can rationalize letting your body repair and recover. You can see the value in that. You see the value in, in yourself. So that's a really good tip too. I think for people that can just, they know themselves, they know that if, even if they say, I'm going to take two weeks off after a few days, they've got itchy feet, they want to get back to it. Just pause and write down, look at the, what you've achieved, reflect on the whole, if it's a year of training, you know, what are the challenges you've overcome? Mm -hmm. Could be injury, could be illness, and then read over that 
and be accountable for that. Mm-hmm. Put, that sort of exercise puts you in a position of authority over where you are now with your training and your fitness and can really help you shift that perspective mm-hmm. from you know, being motivated by fear of, of not running to being motivated by by health and wanting to achieve your goals in a healthy, loving way. Do you think it would also be helpful for someone who maybe knows they've done this mm-hmm. time and time again to like, you know, let's say two weeks out from their race, they're saying, oh, I'm so tired. I really don't want to go for my run. Um, to get, say to maybe a loved one, if I, you know, come back three days after the the race and say, I want to get running again, can you just remind me of this conversation? Perfect. Yeah, a friend, family, support, the people around you. Yeah, make ask them to make you accountable and to remind you. That's a really good idea. Okay, all right. Have you okay. done that? No, I haven't. But I, again, I didn't really struggle with taking the time off. When I took my time off, I was serious about my time off. And I will be again when, when this comes out, I will be in my time off. So <laughs> I will be uh, practicing what I preach. Uh, all right. So I want to switch gears now, um, starting with a question that I don't think we've covered on any podcast before, but mm-hmm. it's something that it's a very specific question. But uh, I think other people will have wondered about this. And this is from Chelsea. She said, is it okay that I work out my personal issues while I run? Or is it not as helpful as I think it might be? Now, this is a question that, Mm -hmm. you know, everyone's going to have their own kind of perspective on dealing with stuff mentally. But is it generally good to kind of use your run to, to figure things out? Or should we be trying to disconnect and just, you know, we hear all about being mindful or being in the moment, but that's kind of taking you out of the moment. What are your thoughts on that? Mm, I think if, if Chelsea, it's Chelsea, isn't it? If Chelsea's finding things popping up as she's running, uh, A, they're important. And, you know, maybe her running time is is her time for her to think. I know people do say that, you know, be in the moment, be present. Uh, I think you can do that while allowing yourself to process thoughts. What I would suggest is, Allow the thoughts and ideas to pop in to your head, Chelsea, and then let them, just let them go and let the next thought come in and try not to judge the thoughts and try not to hook into them. Just notice what you're thinking. And when you get home, write down what you've been thinking about because that could be really helpful because when you look back over that, you can then, when you're not running, you can go, oh, wow, that's really, that's popped up a few times. I really need to think about this. Um, I think it's, again, it's quite personal. You know, some people, depending again on the session, some people actually need to focus on the sort of running they're doing. If they're on the track and they've got to count reps, they need to count the pace, be aware of the pace they're doing for each rep. They really stay task focused. But if you're out for a trail run and, you know, it's an easy run and you're not wearing a watch and you're just in the moment and then a thought pops in about something, a challenge that you've been dealing with, I think that's fine to talk, to think that through. You know, if it's your time, and it feels good, it depends on how that thought or topic is functioning for you. Is it making you feel okay while you're running or is it actually making you feel anxious and nervous? Mm-hmm. Something you need to consider. But it is quite personal. Yeah. You know, when you run, what do you think about? I mean, I actually find quite a lot of the time, yeah, I end up finding a solution to something. Like I might, something might come up in my head that like, oh, yeah, I could do that. Or, um, you know, I'm not going to lie. A lot of the time I'm running along and I'm like, huh. You know, I'm I'm worrying about this or I'm thinking about this. I wonder if everyone else is thinking about this. And then, you know, just being totally honest, I might be like curating an Instagram post while I'm running along in my head. And that's something that I'm essentially working through that thought or that fear myself. And then by the time I've got home, I, I feel, okay, yeah, I've like changed my perspective and, and now I'm going to share that perspective with everyone else. So yeah, I definitely yeah. think I find it helpful to work through things, but um at the same time, I wouldn't say it's it's every run. I think if it's something that's, you know, affecting your hard runs, like you should be able to switch off, I think, if you're going into a hard run or something that's, you know, um, yeah, like a technical part of a trail where you need to pay attention. Like if it's something that's yeah. distracting you so much that you don't notice a man coming up, running behind you and, you know, kind of acting a bit weird, um, a bit scary, then, then yeah, like that's probably something you should try and disconnect a bit from. But I think on, like you said, easy runs, I don't really see the harm. No. And if it's sometimes you don't, as you say, you go out and find a solution without actually realizing you've been thinking about it. So you might leave the house, something will go through your mind, like something, a task that you 
you're trying to work out how to do and you'll you'll it'll come into your mind and then out you'll go running you get back and you do, you have a solution for it you haven't really been thinking about it so you know running allows your mind to tick over and process emotions and thoughts sometimes without you being presently aware of them mm -hmm. um, but sometimes again you can go out and actually have a specific conversation with yourself about something that's been bugging you or not just yeah. something that you want to talk about so yeah I think that's personally I think it's it's okay if it's feeling okay Chelsea then definitely great okay thank you Evie that is helpful I'm sure that's something that many have wor worried about and wondered about um in the past. All right, we're going to get to Kathy's question, which is something a little bit different, but I think we can kind of tie this in and relate it to most people listening in a way that she says, I coach a college track team. And one issue I see a lot of lately is that young athletes quit the sport because they're too anxious about competing. How do we help them to learn that anxiety and fear of failure in their own mind is okay? And that learning to overcome challenges in sport will help them learn to overcome more serious challenges they'll face throughout life. Now, this, as my listeners know, is something really important to me. Put pressure on young athletes and anxiety on young athletes. Maybe not so much college or university level. I feel like by that point, you should be able to handle some level of it. But for both levels, you know, let's talk about fear, fear of failure. What is it, Evie? And then kind of what are your thoughts on her question? Yeah, it's a good one, and it's it's it's. I like that. You know, is it Kathy that's written the question? Kathy, yeah, yeah. It's good that she's she's contributing to this community because that's a relevant question for collegiate athletes, for young kids, for people you know, my age, your age. It's it's really common fear of failure. You know, not finishing a race. Yeah, you know, that whole failure. What is that? Again, it's quite personal. Everyone has a different perception of what failure means for them. And I think for young athletes, and it's something that you see here as well, it's a pattern where they get into the sport, you know, when they're under 10 and they go through it. And then when they get to, to teenage years, other pressures come in, schooling, mm -hmm. friends, peers, you know, big exams. And there's a real, sometimes there's a real drop off with participation. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it is frustrating. And I think one way to encourage the continuation of their sport is to focus on that growth mindset. So, you know, looking at what, what competition is and like we do and saying to yourself and saying to the, the kids, well, okay, this isn't about winning or losing. This is about having a go and participating and what are we going to be able to do really well to the best of our ability to help us feel like we've achieved in this competition. So having that, having even running workshops around competitions could be a good idea. So looking at winning, looking at losing, what is losing? Losing is just not getting the medal. It's not that you've lost. What have you lost? You just haven't won the medal, but you've participated. What have you gained? What have you achieved? That whole uh, encouraging the learning process rather than just the outcome, I think is really important. And you know, over here, I remember a couple of years ago, there was um, a debate, there was a, a football team who, or there was a paper who was were posting results in print in the newspaper and some people were a little bit upset with that. They were posting results of teams that had done really well and teams that hadn't done well and people were saying, you know, you shouldn't be posting the results of people who haven't done well because that makes them feel down and negative and feeling like they're failing and the argument is, well, Results are just results. Someone has to win. You know, if you if you start hiding the fact that people don't win, then there's something you're building up this huge anxiety around and this huge meaning around this this not winning concept. So I think being really open about it and having conversations with with the young athletes and even asking them what does failure mean to you? Mm. It'll be really interesting. I think there'd be different reason for everybody, and even for us, like to me. It, it has a different meaning to, the, to what it means to you. You know, for me, it's it's very personal. I haven't achieved what I can do. I, I know I haven't achieved to the best of my ability. You know, for someone else, it could be, well, I've, I haven't beaten that person, you know, mm -hmm. someone who's more focused on demonstrating their ability rather than developing their ability. Mm -hmm. so someone who, for them, winning is about showing others that they're better than them. Mm -hmm. 
that's some, sometimes that's quite a high motivation with, with athletes. But for the young ones, it's a whole series of things. It's identity, it's pressure. They've probably got other pressures from exams. They don't want to have pressure from sport. So I think having open conversations about failure and really exploring what that is and then encouraging encouraging the process of achieving through training, small achievements will help them feel as though actually there are successes all along the way. The outcome, the medal or the winning or losing of the race is one aspect of their sport. It's not the be all and end all. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, that's I really I could, good. I could, I could come and do some workshops. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kathy, I mean, you obviously aren't a sports psychologist who can do, you know, workshops, but you could, like Evie said, pull the athletes aside and um, talk to them or talk to them as a group to really think about that, have them do some tasks and uh, fill out some information, journal a little bit. And Evie, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. I mean, I don't think it's as bad in the UK as it is here, but in the, in the US, from what I see, children and young, young adults, I'm talking uh, high school or before they go off to university, it's very much a participation. You get celebrated. Um, there isn't really much focus on everyone's a winner. That's kind of the, sorry, that, that is the focus. I would say everyone's a winner is kind of the, there is a winner. There is someone who wins, but people generally get, um, celebrated for like being involved in it and doing it. But when you get to university over here in the U S it, it's a very drastic difference from high school. I've seen this a lot with Steve being a a collegiate coach that a lot of the athletes really struggle because in high school, it's a very social thing. You have fun, you know, there's people that are kind of just on the team um, for fun and just kind of to be there and to to make, make friends. But then university and college is not like that. You come there, you do a job, you um, are expected to try hard and do your best and, and be committed. And it's very intense. And I think, in a lot of ways, this is my total perspective and opinion, and I'm probably going to get shot oh. down for this, but right. I kind of see that they're not really exposed to that before they get to university. They mm. have to kind of learn how to deal with this kind of pressure that you have to be here at this time. You have to do this. You have to show up. You have to be committed. You have to do your stuff on your own, all this stuff. And it's quite, and and perform in races where mm. maybe typically they'd been right at the front, but now in college they're way in the back and and have no idea how to deal with this because they're being they're used to being the stud. I've seen that a lot. Yeah, is there support for collegiate athletes alongside their coaches' support and training? In Not terms really. Of- I'd say the coach is kind of the primary. Okay. Point of contact for anything and everything to do with running. You know, they need they need to have extra support there mm. to help them transition because college is a huge trans a huge change from high school in many ways, mm-hmm. and performance it comes down to it, it's almost like there's more autonomy, more individuality because you're an adult, mm-hmm. you know, you're a young adult, and you're there's more accountability and therefore that equals pressure. Mm-hmm. So it's there's a demand for achievement yet. It's got to come from you, whereas I think when you're younger in high school and even younger, it's more of a you're under the guidance yes. of the teachers and the coaches who nurture you and support you, and then yeah, you're sort of cast out to this world of hang on, I have to, I'm expected to do this to do this for myself. I need to be self motivated here. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, I'd be surprised if there wasn't support for. No, I mean not like from a psychologist. I mean, there's counselling. You can go to a counselling centre. You could go to, um, you know, just the general university one. Um, mm. But from what my experience, there hasn't been anyone to deal with specifically the the mental or the psychological side of things. So very interesting, though, and something mm. to kind of think about. And uh, anything you would add, just for what she said about um, how to teach them that learning to overcome challenges in sport can help them overcome challenges in life because. That doesn't just have to be about college um, athletes. I mean, all of us can learn that getting through the hard moments in our running or in our sport can help us get through hard moments in other parts of our life. What would you say? Yeah, absolutely. I would encourage the communicate the open communication because that's always a big one. You know, young kids often shut down, don't want to talk about things. So encourage even to get them into small groups 
and get them to chat about it, draw what failure is for them. What does it look like for you? What does achievement look like for you? Have fun tasks to do and then come together in a group and talk about it and focus on discussing the process of how you achieve. You know, there's small steps that you have to take and that when you don't achieve and you don't win or you fail, it's not an indication of of your ability. It's often to do with something to do with effort or technique or structure. So it's not a, a complete... Because I think that's what a lot of people feel when they fail. They take it really personally. Oh, that's um, a reflection of my ability and who I am. When actually it could be a reflection of something quite controllable, like well, you just haven't planned, you know, the training enough, and or you haven't looked at your nutrition enough, or you're not giving the right balance, or there's some technique that you need to improve on. Often things that you can control. So I. Yeah, Kathy, I would have those discussions with them and just encourage that open communication. Actually have a session away from a uh, sports hall that involves activity and actually sit mm. down and have a, have a sports psych session, have a, a communication session around it. I think that would be valuable. Okay. All right. Great. Um, and Kathy, you can obviously take that or anyone listening, if you're struggling with fear of failure and just kind of worrying about your outcomes, in addition to what we've kind of already talked about in this episode and the previous one, Um, I'm sure there's plenty of worksheets you can find online that, you know, you can take to this if it, if it does feel a little bit overwhelming to even think about, you know, how to go about this. You've got some. Okay. I will put that in the show notes then so you can go download it and and use it yourself. All right. Yeah. Contact me directly, Kathy. I can have a chat with you more. Great. Thank you, Evie. And finally, we have quite a deep question from Ken who is a psychologist himself. Ooh. So you can, uh, <laughs> you really can get into the deep question here. We're actually going to have Ken on later in the year. He is a superstar himself. Um, and he says, how do you help runners use the sport to learn about themselves as part of a developing and ongoing sense of a healthy self? Oh, I love that question. It's really good. And I'd ask Ken the same question. <laughs> Well, actually, you know I, the answer because Ken recently emailed me with his exact response. So I, I know his. Yeah. I'll forward it to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So um, draw on lots of different elements of what sport means for you. So what you like about the sport. Is it the social side? Is it the sense of achievement? Is it the sense of identity that it gives you? And draw on all the things that create your sport and use those things to help you develop and to nurture your love of the sport. For example, if for you sport represents being social, making connections with people, having friends, then draw on that, you know, make sure that you go running with friends, the people that you train with, uh, see them outside of the sport, make the sport a greater part of your life, not just about performing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that made sense. Yeah. And sit down and, you know, talk about, why people, again, that whole motivation around around sport and achievement and failure, really get to grips with each athlete or each client personally. You know, what does it mean to them? What does achievement look like? What does failure look like? And look at their, help them understand that, you know, sport doesn't define them. It's a choice that they make to do. It's something they love to do. And keeping it in perspective comes down to that strong, healthy, self-awareness and to always, you know, we've talked about this, be kind to themselves. So I practice from an approach of self-compassion and then in order to do that, it's really getting athletes to reflect on themselves and really just knowing a little bit more about why they do things and what motivates them. And, you know, when you react to not winning a race, really look at what you're reacting to, what's upsetting them. Is it disappointing their family? Uh, Is it disappointing themselves? Okay, well, if that's the reason, then I'd sit down and and question that even further. You know, what? Okay, let's say you didn't didn't do well. What does that mean? Does that mean your family won't love you? Mm. Oh, possibly. I'm not good enough. Well, no, you are good enough. You know, so you, you kind of have to, I think, dig a little deeper with everyone as an individual. But I encourage. Know, healthy participation with in a social way, and I encourage challenging themselves. So find a, a race or an event that is actually quite challenging, but realistically achievable, and then work help them to 
and a lot of process to help them achieve that. So again, focusing on some goals that aren't just related to performing and pace, but other goals that relate to life skills. So having a really balanced working week where you know that you've got to eat really well during the week, uh, you've got to rely on your support and your family to help you because, you know, they've got your back, they're part of your sport, having to organise your own kit. So all those social things that build up a sense of responsibility as a person, not just the mm, sport. Mm. So sort of blending, I try and blend the sport into their life and their identity mm-hmm. rather than the other way around. That makes sense. Yep, yep. And I think you do definitely do that very well. And uh, from my personal experience of working with you and uh, this is a good point for me to mention anyone listening. If you are looking uh, at working with a sports psychologist, Evie does have some availability for clients. So uh, I'll have links in her show notes so you can go find her there. Um, now, just on that note, is there, you mentioned about not feeling enough. Um, I've talked about this a lot on the podcast lately, but for anyone listening, just because I love getting different perspectives on this, for f- who feels like they're not enough, they're not fast enough, they're not enough of a good parent they're not enough in one way or another what would be what would you like to say to them right now just to wrap up here I'd want to just give them a hug (laughs) (laughs) and again you know okay take stock so really ask yourself you're not good enough in what way you're not you're not you don't feel like you're a good enough parent or you're not fast enough fast enough for who what are you trying to prove who are you running for what does it mean to you to run look at yourself from the outside and if pretend you were talking to a friend and what would you say to a friend that said the same thing to you? We've had this discussion mm. a lot and I know it sounds a little cheesy. People say, oh, it sounds cheesy. And I just think it sounds really good when yeah, you say, well, if you spoke to your friends the way you sometimes speak to yourself, you probably would you have any? I mean, sometimes I'm guilty of that, you know, that self-critical voice. It's so easy to, to self-sabotage, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So I would... I would say practice self-compassion. In fact, there's um, a, a good friend and, and uh, colleague of mine wrote a really interesting article on self-compassion, okay. and I'll, I'll forward you that because yeah. um, it's really well evidenced in sport to be beneficial to mm-hmm. performing and to, to feeling success, to be self-compassionate. So I would um, yeah, send that around to, to everyone on the community. I can even post it on the community um, okay. Facebook because it's yeah, really useful. Yeah, Thanks we can do Chloe. both of those. Uh, put that in the show notes and we can um, also uh, have you post that. All right, Evie, um, you've already done the running for real four. So I'm just going to wrap this up here and uh, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, Once again, how can people find you if they want to follow you, learn from you and just get to know you more? Yeah, thank you. I love these chats that we have, you know, you're a good friend and, and an amazing podcaster and online mm-hmm. community supporter uh, with your community. I think it's great. Uh, find me on Facebook or my website, eviesaventi.com, email. I'll give you my details for everyone, but I try and post pretty regularly. It's one thing I need to do more of, <laughs> build my own business. But, yeah, I'll, um, I'll try and contribute to more to the, to the community. Great. And, yeah, I really look forward to seeing how everyone goes, those running in uh, Boston, what, two weeks? When is it? It's well, by weeks. the time this comes out, it'll be out. It'll be done. Ah. We'll be over. But yeah, it'll, <laughs> it'll be exciting to um, hear and uh, hear and see all the results. And uh, I think London Marathon is this weekend of this podcast, I believe. So good luck to anyone running if you are listening to this before. Uh, Evie, thank you so much yes. for always being a bright, shining light in this world. And uh, we appreciate you. So thank you. Oh, pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tina. I've really enjoyed it. and look forward to hearing what people think our podcast yep i'm sure they'll love it warmer weather is starting to get us and even though we've forgotten all about those bad sides of it in our daydreams about the summer the sweat pours down your face in those first few months well it does for me it used to drive me absolutely crazy when I would get a bead of sweat inside my earbuds. How I got in there, I don't know. And it would block the sound. I would try and get the, the sweat out. Just the one drop, I would try and dry it. But you know, you're already soaked and it just didn't work. But with aftershocks, you don't have to worry about that because they sit outside your ear and conduct the sound through bone conduction technology. 
Sounds intense, but it's ideal, especially this time of year when you're still adjusting to running outside without 3 million layers on. That being said, these can handle any weather conditions. Aftershocks have a wide dynamic sound range, deep bass and dual noise cancelling mics. You can hear your music or podcast clearly and even have phone calls. I've tested that out too and left them on for a while while I pretty much forgot that they were there. You can get $50 off Trex Air or Trex Titanium Endurance Bundle at tina.aftershocks.com. That's T-I-N-A dot A-F-T-E-R-S-H-O-K-Z dot com. I absolutely love mine and I have a feeling you will too. Thank you to Noonie for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I've mentioned last month that I've never actually had any knee issues, but I know many of you had. So I offered to send it out to a few superstars and Nuni were happy to oblige and they gave it a try. So I'm not going to tell you what I think because I haven't used it. I never have really struggled with knee issues But Kate said it worked really well. I kept expecting the pain to creep in as I went longer, but it didn't. Erin said I used it for about a week, did a short recovery run without it, and I did feel the knee pain creep back in. And Michelle says I have worn new knee for four runs now. It definitely makes a difference. The first time I thought it wouldn't do anything because it just didn't feel like it would be but I was able to run completely with no pain. When I took the brace off, I did have some pain in the knee, so I know it was helping. Now, if you're wondering what new knee is, it's an innovative new product designed to provide immediate relief of runner's knee symptoms. Elite athletes use it, recreational runners use it, and even running injury specialist Dr. Ben Chateau prescribes it to his runners. Knee pain can be debilitating, so let Nuni get you back to your running schedule and stop that runner's knee. Go to nunishop.com and use promo code Tina Muir for 20% off. That's N U N E E S H O P.com and use code T I N A M U I R for 20% off. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. A lot of different topics, things we haven't covered before. And I think that's always good. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Evie. And if you missed the first one, be sure to go back and find it. It's episode 108. And you know what you could do to make sure you never miss an episode? You could be sure to go to your favorite podcast player or um, app or whatever it is you listen to and subscribe to the podcast. That way you won't miss an episode. It'll come right to you in the future. Now, there's another reason to subscribe. If you love these episodes, I have a full week of mental training, sports psychology, motivational episodes coming to you the week of May 20th. So if you subscribe in your favorite podcast player, those will come right to you. One reminder, Evie is taking on clients. So if you do feel like that's something you need in your life, be sure to go visit her website, eviceventi.com, which you can also find in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 113. And next week we have a rather tricky topic, but one that honestly scares me a little as I don't want to say the wrong thing to hurt someone, but it's something that needs to be shared. It needs to be discussed. And I felt it was time we brought someone on who has absolutely been through it and is just so inspiring. So next week, we will have Sarah Canny on the show and we'll be covering eating disorders. If this episode could be triggering for you, I wanted to give you a heads up ahead of time. But I think this is really important and Sarah is wonderful. So I think you will really appreciate it regardless of whether you have been in a situation like this or or not. I'm sure we all know someone who has struggled with their eating in the past and this will be helpful for all of us. So until then, have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.